Kushina giggled as her husband Minato poked her growing belly. Naruto's going to be popping out of there in about two months, he teased. In response, she smirked and poked him back. And when he does, you better be ready for all those sleepless nights. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're continuing the adventure, Shinobi. Huge shout out to the amazing author. Check out their details in the description below. Want to follow along? The link's right there for you. In this session, we'll be exploring chapters 5 to 8. Don't forget to smash that like button and drop a comment. Your engagement helps us out with the algorithm and means the world to us. Alright, let's jump into the story. Seven months had come and gone like water flowing down a mountain. Minato and Kushina realized that now, with no signs of Kanoha Shinobi anywhere near them, or without any detection of chakra around them but their own that this was it. They've been living pretty much on beds of random inns that they had traveled to. But they weren't alone, Midori had tagged along with them. She wanted to learn their ways, and the girl was very persuasive, suggesting that more of them would pose a lesser risk to Kushina for when she got to the later stages of pregnancy. So, the day they had left, she bid her father a farewell. That was three months ago, and that was an entirely different continent. Now, they walked the desert sands of Akuo and Sanus. Kushina's stomach had bulged now. They also found out the baby was going to be a boy. Keeping a low profile was their bread and butter. Minato took on random work with Midori. Sometimes it involved manual labor, but often he turned to his normal skills of being a shinobi. He gained the reputation of being a huntsman, and Midori was going on these missions with him to learn from the man himself. In the end they were staying in, Kushina sat at a table. Her headcloth helped keep the heat down, and the clothing she wore was fit for the region they were in constant heat and very little rain, it was like being in Suna inside the middle of summer. The sound of boots filled her ears as she saw Midori and her husband enter. She smiled upon noticing him with a very proud look on his face. Midori had a few cuts on her arms and forelegs, but other than that she seemed relatively unharmed. I didn't have to do a single thing that mission, Minato stated with pride. Midori took on those Beowulfs on her own. Midori, wow, that's really good. Kushina praises as she saw the team take a seat in front of her. She smiles. It wasn't big deal, got into a bit of a tussle with the Alpha though, gave him a fiery kiss, she hinted at what she had done. Right down his gullet it went, and then boom. Minato looks at Kushina, looking around to make sure no one was listening. Midori takes well to fire, I have a fire affinity, Kushina then chuckled. You are suggesting a teacher what I know? Might as well, if she is coming along nicely. Perhaps it would be best to teach her while you're unable to fight, Naruto is gonna popping out of there in about two months. Minato jokes as he poked her stomach, feeling his son kick at the irritation. The redhead giggles a little bit, though it was a little discomforting at the feeling of a baby kicking within her womb. The mother to be beamed with pride, it would seem fate had smiled on her at last. Despite the hardships of this world, she and Minato adapted rather well. Suddenly the doors to the inn opened, revealing a woman in a white cloak and silver eyes. There was some silence in the inn, but all in all, things kept going like normal. She walks up toward the table as her partner came in, a man with blonde hair and blue eyes. The duo seemed tired, can't believe that duet got that job before us. Calm down, Summer. The man laughed as she pouted while taking a seat. I mean, look on the bright side, we're spending some time together like old times. Well, that was before you had Yang. The woman in the white cloak, Summer, pointed out. Still, it isn't nothing to be mad at. Perhaps we can get a mission hunting down a bigger grim. Ooh, I know what would cheer you up. How about hunting down a golem? The blonde man asked, trying to cheer her up. It could be fun. She mumbles, Taeyong. Golem grim, sheesh. And here I thought I was starting to feel like a badass. Midori openly commented without realizing. Taeyong and Summer turned toward where the comet came from, finding a table with three people at it. Everyone locked eyes with one another, judging each other, and stacking each other up just in case things went very south. Were you talking about us? Taeyong asks as he got to looking at Minato. Oh no, no, we're simply just talking about Grimm in general. But you're making it sound like a golem Grimm is just easy pickings. Oh, you wouldn't happen to be the White Reaper and the Golden Dragon. Midori suddenly yells out as she got a look at them. Minato looked at her, she had a subtlety a little better. However, if anything, Midori was like a young teenage Kushina. Always full of energy, spunky, and had more moxie than most. The duo at the other table got up, walking over toward their table. Well, lucky guess there, we are those two. Summer reveals as she looks at the girl. And your name is? I'm Midori. Midori answered the woman. Oh, I must say your eyes, quite beautiful, miss. Oh, thanks. Summer gushed a little. I have to say, though, you have beautiful hair. Ah, oh, shucks. I think the job you were talking about is one eye and my master took. The faunus revealed earning some looks from the crowd. Minato sighs as he looked at the duet that had joined them. She means teacher by that notion. I'm Minato, and you both are. 
Summer rose, Summer extends her hand, to which Minato took, I'm greatest huntress in Vale. Taeyong chortles at his partner. I guess I'm Taeyong Shaolong, second best huntsman in Vale. Summer then looks at Kushina, ogling her stomach. Oh my, that is a mighty big bun in the oven there. Kushina laughs a little. Yeah, he'll be out in a month or so. Ooh, Summer coos as she looked the woman's stomach move around. I've always wanted a kid. Oh well, haven't you too? Kushina looked between her and Taeyong. The two blushed a little bit with Taeyong answering, No, we just started dating a few months ago. Minato laughs nervously. Well, you're very forthcoming with that. I see any stranger as a friend yet to be made. Summer stated as she held her hand. Allow me to buy the first round, though knowing those that bear buns in the ovens may want to stick to lemonade. Kushina couldn't help but laugh. You're certainly a ball of energy. Thank you, um. She looked at Redhead. What is your name? Kushina. Kushina no Mikaze. The blonde sitting by me is my husband, Minato. Kushina tells them as she got looked at by Minato as well. Minato smiles as he looked at Tiong and held his hand out. It's a pleasure. Sorry for cutting in on your mission, we just needed the money. No biggie, I totally get it. You got a baby on the way, been there, done that. It is stressful. It's even more stressful when the mother ends up walking out. But it's awesome in a way, because I never realized that the true love of my life was always by my side. Taeyong states while holding Summer's hand. She giggles, hey now, not until we're in our room. The older couple sitting at the table stare at the younger pair. They all enjoyed a quick laugh. Midori was looking over her shoulder, seeing a young man with black hair staring at her. He had yellow eyes and seemed to be a faunus if the claws in his hands were any indicators. She waved at him nervously, and he only nods his head in acknowledgement. The teens shared a small smile between them. He looked at the adults talking, and looked at her. He mouthed toward her. Hey, are you a huntress in training? The girl nods, mouthing back at him. Are you a huntsman in training? No, white fan, we're looking for recruits. He mouths as he smirked, looking at the humans talking amongst themselves. Midori frowned a little. Sorry, kinsman, I have no need for the fong. It's all good, what about dinner? He had a sly grin on his face as he mouthed the question. Midori couldn't but giggle a little bit, drawing some attention to herself. Midori, Kushina interrupts her. Who are you talking to? Oh, that guy over there. She points at the other faunus in the room. He's asking me to dinner. Ooh, look at you, Kushina laughed. Oh, you should go for it, you've earned it. The girl nods and got up, walking over toward the boy. Her clothing fluttered in the small little gasps of wind from the man doors of the inn. She sat down in front of him. He looks at her and just gave a soft smile. Welcome to my corner kinsman. The teen said as he looked at Midori. I'm a bit surprised that you're traveling with humans. Well, these humans saved my father's life. I'm not indebted to them. I just want to learn the ways of a huntsman so I can be a huntswoman. Midori tells the boy. Hearing the table, she came from laughing a little as the adults began talking. The slightly older teen in front of her nods. I can respect that, truth be told. I'm not really interested in recruiting for the farm. Our local leader is on a bit of a power trip. Uh, I know how those go. I'm from Windpath. She reveals to him. I'm Midori. I'm Samson, Samson Bellflower, charmed to meet my green friend. He reaches over and grabs her hand before kissing it. The girl giggled a little bit. Well, Samson, why is someone like you here? Lazily recruiting, he waved as he spoke. Tell you the truth, though Vacuo has always been good to Faunus if you got hard hide to handle some of the things that go on here. So, I've noticed. Midori agreed as she looked at the various people. So, Samson, why invite me to dinner? I don't know, guess either I'm just bored, or... He leaned in a little bit. You're just strikingly beautiful. My, what a charmer, she laughed. Oh, all right. I'll let you take me to dinner, but you're paying. That's fine. Gentleman always pays. Besides, I'm sure your teachers won't mind, right? Samson inquires as he notices the humans continuing to talk. Oh no, my teacher's wife encouraged me to come over here. Kind of glad I did. Midori flirted a little, and he just smiles. The faunus pair leans back in their chairs. He looked at her eyes. You've got some beautiful eyes. They're sweet cheeks. Very foxy. Who playing with my traits are we? Were you, cute little kitty? She teases as he leaned back and just laughed. He looked at her, noting the smile. Oh no. I'm actually Pine Martin. The two young teens looked at each other, and then she looks at the table where her friends were. Smiling, she nods toward Kushina, and then turns back toward the Pine Martin faunus, smiling. So, wanna go have some dinner right now? She asked with a smirk. Samson got up from the table. Ladies first out the door. The adults watched the teens walk out of the inn, just as a waiter brought their drinks. Minato looked at his strawberry soda, smiling as he turned to Kushina. In a way, strangely, he looked to Midori as a little sister of sorts he never had. He was happy to see her smile, and she was a very attentive student. She needed some freedom. Summer had a strawberry sunrise in her hand. To our fellow co-workers, with love from Vale. I Taeyong agreed with his glass raised. But more importantly, my long-lost brother, though I got the better looks. Kushina jabbed her elbow into Minato as she laughed. The man didn't need the hint, he was laughing already, and clinked his glass against Taeyong's. The quartet down their drinks, Kushina lightly sipping her lemonade. Summer looked at Kushina. He went shopping for baby clothing yet? Not yet, Kushina admitted as she rubbed her stomach. He's wanting to pop though, we just haven't found a place to settle down. Ooh, we may know a place, but it's in Vale. Summer points out as she and Taeyong looked at each other. Taeyong nods and looked at Minato. 
There's a little island off the coast of Vale City. Patch, a perfect place to raise few kids. We'll keep that in mind, Kushina replied as she took a swig of her lemonade. We just don't know where to settle yet. Yeah, Minato looked at them with a smile. The life we lead is treacherous, but it's good to see that someone can understand us a little. And that understanding is what makes us friends as I said, everyone is just a friend unmade. But I do have a question for you Kushina, Summer finished her drink. Does it feel weird when he kicks? Oh of course, but it's well worth the feeling. I take pride in becoming a mother, she says with a small tear running down her eye. It's been my dream for a long time. Ah, uh, the huntress in front of comforted the slightly older woman. If anything, if how you're bringing up your student is showing, I think you'll be an epic mom. The couple laugh, Minato felt calm around them, just radiated good vibes. The young suddenly burps, making everyone look at her. She giggled nervously as she got another drink, and Taeyong just held his face laughing. Well, Minato and Kushina, it was nice meeting you. Here are our scroll contact numbers, think about Patch. I'll be taking a teaching job up there shortly, I'm just getting money to get a place. It isn't cheap up there, but it's well worth saving up for some land. Taeyong tells them and nodded his head at Kushina. May your child be healthy if it is born before we meet again. And may your love blossom, she replied in kind with a nod. Summer and Taeyong walked off as a band started playing in the inn. Minato looked at Kushina. The woman had begun to seriously wonder if they should look towards settling down upon the island they were talking about. Minato smiled and leaned over to give Kushina a kiss. The two shared a very short, but very passionate kiss. A couple of weeks passed. Minato had gone on missions by himself. Each mission lasted about a few hours. He had begun saving his money more and gaining more so he could get ready for the pre-verbal nest. Midori was with Samson. They had a nice dinner. It wasn't anything expensive. A couple burgers, some fries, and some ice cream. Just like the other little dates they had together. And he seemed very nice. Didn't try to push her into anything. The two were walking around Vacuo. Samson explaining the city to her. The girl was gobsmacked and awestruck. She walked with Pep in her step following Samson as they passed some musicians playing on the street. Samson made his way through the people, Midori looks at him. Where are we going? I need to check up on my brother, Samson told her as he led her through the people. You don't have to go with me. Oh no, I'm loving this so far, I've never been this happy since I started traveling with Minato and Kushina. Midori reveals their names and Samson smiled. They come to a small dilapidated house, and reality hit Midori a little. She watches as Samson opens the door. There were no pictures of him with his parents or anything on the walls. She heard the coughing of a little child in the bedroom. There she saw Samson's brother, a small little pine martin faunus like his older brother. He had a fresh bowl of soup by him. He looked up at his older brother. The child had black blotches around his arms, signs of the plague. Hey, big brother. The little child greeted his brother. Who's that? A friend I met. I was just dropping in to check on you, Danny. Samson walks over toward the child. Are you feeling a little better? A little? The little black-haired boy answered. Oh, my chest still hurts when I cough, and I keep coughing up some black stuff. That didn't sound good at all, but Dory looked at the boy with sadness. Samson sighed as he rubbed his little brother's head, and then looked at Midori. The girl smiled, showing a brave face. I'll be back later, little brother. I'll bring you home some cheesecake. The teen leaned down and kissed his brother on the head. The two older teens walk out of the room and out of the house. Midori, however, still felt wrong about leaving the child there. Samson looked at her and sighed. I'm sorry, it must be weird, but I drop in on him at random. I don't tell him, a doctor in the fong said his situation is hopeless. Samson sighed, and I lied about other things. I'm not really from the fong. I just needed to get away from it. I'm a horrible brother, the teen continued as he looked at Midori. I keep trying to distract myself because I don't want to know when you know. No, I get it, it's fine. Midori looked at the boy in there. What is keeping him from fighting it? Danny was born with weak lungs. My parents were huntsmen, and they died on a mission. We've been living on what we could get off the streets, and I do odd jobs. I'm good at crafting and such, that's how I make money. But I just wish, I wish there was some way I can make Danny's lungs stronger or heal them. Samson lowered his head. I feel like a failure of a brother. Samson, Midori sighed as she looked at him. I can understand that, trust me. It was hard in Wind Path with me and my father. My mother got killed by the gangs there. Ah. Oh. Samson breathes as he looks at her. I hope you don't feel used. I just keep up the illusion that I'm fine and I'm not. She sighed. I wish there was something I could do to help. Samson smiles as he looks at her. Well, you're certainly taking it well. I'm used to the weird by now, she replied while looked at him. Oh. So, I guess this where I part ways. Yeah, well, I'll see you later. I know this was weird, but I... Samson just sighs as he looked down at the ground. Midori frowns, walking away quickly, not wanting him to see her look of determination. Kushino was taking deep breaths as she struggled to get up. Whoa, you start to get heavy in there, Naruto. She notices Midori coming into their room. Midori, you alright, sweetheart? Not really. Midori admitted as she lowered her head. Oh, I just found out Samson was just going out with me to distract himself. His little brother is dying. Oh dear, that is awful. Kushino walks over toward the girl giving her a small hug. The girl scrunches up a little bit. I'm sorry, Kushina. I really am, but I need to learn something from you. 
Midori, Kushina breaks the hug. You know, we can't just. I know we can't. But what's the point of teaching me this stuff if I can't use it to help others? Midori yells as her feelings take over. She activates the silencing seals in the room that Minato had placed. She takes a deep breath. I'm not saying you or Minato is selfish. These are your powers. You gave them to me. Gods know I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you too. But I beg of you. Please, please let me learn that jutsu you used to heal my father. I don't want to see a little boy die when there's something I could have done to stop it. Midori starts crying as she looked at Kushina. I don't want to see someone so young lose their life because good people didn't act. Kushina looks at Midori. She takes a deep breath. You realize, if this gets out, Minato will be upset at both of us. I know she lowered her head. And if you want to kick me out, I'll leave. I never said that, but if intend to do this, I'll teach you. But Midori, the power to save a life is a powerful technique. You trade your life force, and there's no guarantee it'll work. Kushina walks over toward her and rubber face. She looked up at the door. I think Minato already knows. Yeah, I've been standing here for a minute. So, Midori, you want to use Jutsu to save a young boy's life? He asks her, looking at her body language. It was very conflicted. She nodded as her eyes gazed upon her master. Yes, Minato-sensei. Fine. Minato allowed as he looked into her eyes. However, if you do this, they must come with us. I know, the same as me, right? We'll teach them, right? She inquires as Minato looked at her. He nods as he looked over at Kushina. That'll be fine, but he'll have to earn the right to learn our techniques. I understand, sensei. Midori bowed and then walked toward the door. Will you be here when I get back? Of course. Minato comforted the girl and smiled. I'm proud of you. You got a sense of kindness that I hope my son has when he grows up. He followed her out the door, intent to teach her the shows in Jutsu. Night fell across Vacuo. Samson held his little brother. He was immune to the plague. However, his little brother had the unfortunate luck to not be. He holds his little brother as the young child coughs up the black flam profusely, splattering it on the shirt he was wearing. It was nearing that time. Samson just held his brother tightly. Please, gods, please. Suddenly, he heard his door open. Seeing Midori rush in, she had a scarf over her mouth as she slid to her knees where his brother. Midori, what are? He was totally silenced when she started to fumble around with her hands. However, he heard a loud signal of sorts, a pulse of energy. He saw that her hands started to glow green. Midori took very well to learning new stuff, and right now it was coming as a godsend. Slowly but surely, she took a deep breath. Shosen Jutsu. She whispers as she placed her hands over the boy's chest. Samson watches as the little black veins on his brother's chest began to recede, and then shocking his brother's aura activated as well. Slowly, but surely Midori transferred as much chakra she could to possibly activate his chakra network like Minato had done for her, but in turn she was using the healing technique to try and save him. He watches as his brother's face started to gain color back into it. The young child opened his golden eyes, looking up at his big brother. He smiles, looking at him with a faint light in his eyes. The light was coming from Midori, using whatever she was to heal his brother. Big brother, I saw Mama and Papa. Danny mumbles as he looked into his brother's eyes. Mama and Papa, say they love us. They are proud of you, Sansa heard Danny say. Big brother, Samson was sobbing as he held his brother's hand as the blotches began to disappear. He smiles, holding the child's hand as he relaxed. Slowly, but surely the glowing stopped. Midori was breathing hard. She wanted to continue, but she was out of chakra to use. Slowly, she leaned back before falling over, breathing harder than before. They said, it would take a lot of me. They weren't pulling my leg. Midori, Samson stopped sobbing. What did you do? I did the right thing. Midori replied as she looked at Samson. I use what I've been taught to save someone. Taught. He looked at her. You mean that wasn't just trick of aura? It is, kind of. But, since you saw, I need you to know that it comes with a price. Midori then grinned slightly. More burgers, and you've got to come with us. Samson looks at her, then looked at his brother. That's fine, I think I owe you that much. The girl looks at him, nodding as she just laid back. I'm out of energy. Well, sleep here, Samson hands her his pillow. As I said, I owe you. You owe me nothing. Midori told him as she took the pillow. You just had a rough go of it, and we're honest about it. Right? Samson mumbled as he looked at her. But what exactly did you do? It's a long thing to explain, Midori tells him. I'd rather you wait until morning when we go to see my friends. He nodded. I can do that. Minato was sitting in the room with Kushina. We'll have two more people joining us, enough for a team. Kushina leaned up, wrapping her arms around Minato. We've waited long enough. I think Midori has a point. If we can start making a difference, then should we? I just don't want to put you or our child in danger. Minato sighed and then looked out the window. The poor we've seen, the sick we've passed. I just didn't want to risk our power falling into the wrong hands. Midori is a smart girl. And if she wanted to help someone, that someone desperately needed it. The redhead argues as she held on to her husband. As we will win. Oh no. Minato takes her hand as he comforted her. He won't get out. I promise. Samson and Minato clashed forearms. The two threw punches at each other, with a younger man quickly losing his footing and getting slammed into the ground by the much older blonde. The former Yandame Hokage of Kanoha then quickly stepped back and elbowed, charging Midori. She blocked the strike with her forearms, dodging a couple of his punches. 
He smirks before suddenly kicking her in the side. The teen slams into the ground from the powerful kick. The leader of their troop simply smirked as he felt Samson get up behind him. He slams his elbow back again, catching Samson in the gut before throwing him over his shoulder. Samson hurdles into Midori as she tries to get up, both laying on top of each other, aura sparking, and out of energy. Very good you too. Minato leans back as an arrow went flying past him. Ah Danny, good for you to join us. The boy was standing on a nearby tree, holding a bow and knocking another arrow. Danny, give it up brother. Samson moans as he got up and off Midori before helping her up. There's no chance at beating Blondie Sensei. Dang, almost had him though. Danny complains as he removed the arrow off the string. He extends his claws before rapidly climbing down the tree, landing on his feet as he jumped the last few feet down. The dry arid air of Vacuo's northernmost forest stained their mouths. They had come here after a month and a half of training. Kushino was overlooking them, her stomach bulging now. Minato and the other had been busy over the last month, leaving Vacuo's main city while secretly building a small shelter in the woods. It was there that he had told them about what was to happen. Their other teacher was going to give birth, but in doing so had the potential to unleash a monster. That monster lived in her gut, and at first Samson and Danny openly admitted to that they wanted to leave. However, Midori convinced them to stay. They were scared, but the fear faded with time. Midori was going to be the midwife. Today was October 9th, the day before this all was to go down. She looks at them, watching as they knelt on their knees in front of Minato. He lectured them often, not harshly, but teaching them the meanings of chakra. The woman saw why he easily found followers in his earlier years on the battlefield. He was charismatic when he wanted to be. Midori nods at one piece of the lecture smiling. She looked over at Samson and Danny as they nod, agreeing with another part. Getting up, all of them put their hands out, sharing chakra between themselves as it revitalized strained coils. Kushina had made it a point to teach them the Shosen Jutsu, just in case they got hurt and she wasn't there to heal them. They all easily mastered the Jutsu, which just showed the potential the group of fledglings had. Getting up from the ground the group set about doing chores. Samson and Danny were assigned to gather firewood, and Midori was to prepare the shelter for the arrival of the baby. Minato walks over to his wife, who was sitting on a soft patch of savanna grass. She was wearing a light red tunic. Her husband sat by her, looking at the forest they would be calling home for a few days before going back to the city. Kushina huddled up close to him, looking at him, and then took a deep breath. Minato, she started before looking down at the ground. The QB keeps whispering to me in my sleep. Minato looks at his wife's eyes, noticing she had been lacking sleep. Kushichin, you'll be okay? I want you to promise me that if the worst happens that you'll get those children away. Kushina said as her hands tightened onto his. I know, it most likely won't, I just. Kushina Uzumaki, she stared right at him in surprise, but he had a smile on his face. The man leans down, pressing his head forward onto hers. Our love will hold him at bay, so don't you dare get scared. She nods, smiling as they then shared a passionate kiss. He picks her up and walks toward the shelter, entering it through a makeshift door. There was a specialized makeshift bed on the floor of the structure. Unlike the other beds that mainly consisted of cloth on the floor. The reason was simple. Midori needed space so she could grab Naruto and help Kushina with the birth. They needed to work fast, and there was no way it could be done over a long period of time. Minato may have had chakra, even sin and moto. However, Hours of concentration and labor would certainly give the massive demon fox in her gut the chance of breaking free. So, as she was laid onto the bed, where she was going to be catered for for the next three days, Kushina, the soon-to-be mother, took a deep breath and went to ask for what she wanted for supper. It was happening, night had come on October 10th. The darkness outside, the songs of the night, drowned by the wailing of a woman with red hair. Midori was ingenious in designing last-minute stirrups to help keep Kushina's from accidentally kicking out or closing her legs. The cloth hanged from the ceiling, allowing a very little movement. The woman in the makeshift bed mewled in pain as her stomach was exposed. Deep breaths and the bubbling ooze of the seal slowly breaking or remaining in limbo was evident of this difficult birth. Oh gods, it hurts, huh? Kushina screams as she gripped the sheets. The soon-to-be father looks at his wife. Kushichan just keep pushing, it won't be long. They had been going at this for the last three hours, the man was exhausted already, and his nature chakra reserves got exhausted the second hour in. Kushina, for all that she was, holds the bed sheets in a death grip. In her head, the roaring of a demon alarms her. Red chakra bubbles up from the seal, making Minato wince as he felt his chakra reserves take a big hit while forcing the demon's influences back into his wife's seal. Come on Naruto, Minato growled as he looked at Midori. Do you see his head yet? I see a little bit of it blonde hair, but I can't risk grabbing him yet. Midori answers as she felt a little light-headed watching this happen. She hears Kushina screaming, Naruto come on, your daddy needs you to come out, I need you to come out. Kushina sensei a little bit more. Midori yells as she sees more of the baby's head. A little bit more and can make an attempt. Ah. Oh. Kushina wails while pushing, please, please be careful with him. I swear on my life, I swear on my entire family, Naruto won't be hurt by me. Midori comforts her mistress and then looks to her master, Minato-sensei is, 
Just focus on Naruto. Minato tells her as he glares at the seal, I'll focus on this. He had sweat rolling off him, looking down at the seal growling larger and bubbling more. The QB was thrashing in the seal, and knew that the last chance to get out was now. So with it fighting harder, Minato had to respond in kind. The blonde-haired father to be looked at Kushina. Naruto come out, QB you stay in. Midori looks at the door. Samson bring the water as I told you to already. Samson came running in, yelling repeatedly, I'm not looking. He ran and placed the bucket of hot water him, and Danny had been heating over the fire as best they could. The water wasn't hot, it was lukewarm at best. Midori watches as Samson ran back outside. She felt bad about yelling at him like that, but this was critical. Suddenly a blast of red emerged from Kushina as she arcs back. Minato was thrown across the shelter. Midori was as well struggling to keep where she was. Screaming as the blast of wind tore the roof off the shelter. Samson suddenly came running in. What was Minato doing? He was just feeding Chakra into the seal. Midori yells as she watches Samson quickly run over toward Kushina with Danny. Kushina thrashes about Minato. The redhead's eyes turn red as she felt searing pain across her body. Minato got back into the shelter, placing his hands over the seal. He quickly re-establishes his chakra link with it, but his eyes widened on how much damage was dealt with it. Inside of her mind, Kushina watches as several chains snap on the giant fox hanging above her. Her eyes widened when she realized what was happening, and suddenly, it sneered at her. She was on the ground, breathing hard as she felt pain. Nothing but pain. I told you woman, the QB gloated as more chains broke. That I would win an end. It snaps an arm free, trying to grab her, but she manages to leap out of the way in time. It growls but then smirks as it reaches over to the chains binding its other arm. Slowly but surely it broke them. The seal was too weak. They were taking too long. He was going to free. Kushin has stood up straight. I won't let you win. I've already won. It sneers, a pathetic husband your mate made. Killing you and your child will be kindness. Such a weak man. Shut up. Kushina looked dead into the creature's eyes. You don't get to talk about my husband or my child, you overgrown furball. Suddenly several chains emerge from Kushina as they slam the fox back into the orb of earth. It struggles, roaring in rage as she glares right into its eye. I am Kushina Uzumaki, heir to the Uzumaki clan of Yuzugakir. You are just an incarnation of hatred, and you will never ever beat me. I'll be a damn good mother and a damn good wife at that point as well. You will just have to be contented with seating your furry ass on that rock and watching as our life becomes happy. Kushina screams as she tightens the chains, adding new ones where the old ones weren't before. She felt tears sting her eyes. You don't have the right to destroy anyone's happiness because you're just miserable and wallowing in your own self-pity. You little red-headed witch. The QB roared in a rage. Oh, how could you do this? Why is this happening? I had you. I was free. I was free. It screams echoed in the void of her mind. She stands there, watching as it thrashes. She then felt something pat on her shoulder, but when she turns around there was nothing. The giant fox gives up struggling, looking right at her. Growling, it just sighed, this time you win. Before she could retort, she felt herself kicked out of the mindscape. Minato was holding his hand over the seal, watching it suddenly take back its original shape. Holding strong, it then came to attention that someone was crying. His eyes widened. It wasn't Danny that was crying, or Samson. It wasn't even Midori, not Kushina. The high-pitched wailing of a baby filled the air. Slowly, but surely reality hit him as Kushina moved her hand to his. Squeezing it as Midori suddenly got up after using a knife on something. She ran object in her hands under the water for a moment, wiping off the placenta, and then quickly wrapped a white cloth around it. Minato was close to crying, but Kushina was already sobbing as she heard the baby wailing. Congratulations! Midori smiled as she handed the baby over to Kushina. Kushina-sensei, Minato-sensei, he's here and boy, does he kick. Kushina looked at the bundle in her arms, seeing three whisker marks on his cheeks. Apparently, the chakra of the QB saturated him while he was in the womb, giving him the features. However, if anything, it just added to his cuteness. Samson was breathing hard, so was Danny as they fell back onto the floor. Sweet gods in heaven, and Neriku. Please tell me that all women don't have monsters in their bellies. Danny breathed as he felt pain in his body. I'm out of energy, brother. As am I, Samson looks at Minato who looked at them smiling. Is the little blondie good? He's perfect. Minato answered them. Thank you, boys. You didn't have to step in like that. Screw that. You took us in without really knowing us to us your family. Now you're here. Danny placed his hand over his chest. Loyalty is family, no matter the color of banner or blood in your vein. Yeah. Danny cheers. Midori suddenly stands in front of them, hearing Kushina rustling with her tunic behind her. She was going to feed Naruto for the first time, but the fox faunus got in front of them to shield some of her modesty. What was left of it anyway? Minato lets her legs down from the stirrups. He brought the blanket over her. Sorry guys, but I think Kushina sensei needs a little privacy with Minato sensei, Midori says while standing in front of them. Danny frowns. Why? Because boys and girls don't usually expose themselves to each other. Midori blushes as she answers the kid's question. Now just face the wall or something. Samson laughs a little as he scoots to turn around and face away. You're cute when you get angry, Midori. 
Blushing, Midori just grumbles as she faces away and back toward the loving new family. Kushino was caressing her child's head, kissing it as he fed off her. Minato knelt by the makeshift bed, looking at his son. He was so small, but he was healthy by the looks of it. The little boy opens his eyes. Oceans of tears pour from Minato as two sets of azure eyes met with each other. Hey there, little buddy. The new father greets his son. I'm your daddy. The baby continues to feed off its mother, paying no heed to him. Minato lowers himself down and kissed his son's head. He rested his head on Kushina's side, watching his son. They all stayed there, huddled in the broken shelter. But no grim showed its face. The half of the year that came and went was challenging, between caring for an infant and training the others. However, Minato had begun to quickly establish himself. Slowly but surely what was three grew to more people. The sick they began to heal. The ones that wanted to protect those they loved and held dearest to themselves. Those who sought change, freedom, and equality in a broken world. His first three students had all been faunus beforehand. Embers that ignited the flames of change. Those that were broken from the long hunts of Grimm and were no longer useful to their nation. It was bound to happen sooner or later, either when his son grew up and found himself a wife. Someone would get into a fight where there was no choice and had to use jutsu. This didn't matter anymore, for all his initial fears, the year he spent on this new world made him come to terms that all people wanted one thing. Freedom. Freedom from corrupted councils, politicians, slavers, and more importantly, the fear of Grimm. Naruto was his child, and he wanted to create a legacy for his firstborn to be proud of one day. It was fate that the light of leadership would shine itself on him once more. As he walked under the cover of a large tent, he looks at the cradle the crafter made them as a reward. His son slept peacefully, that was good. He then turns toward the entrance of the large tent and exits it. There, if destiny was real, it was taking shape. A few dozen men, women, and children looked at him. They knelt on their right knee, bending themselves, and their wills to him and him alone. Some didn't call him sensei like he had taught them to. Instead, some began to use the phrase Lord Minato. And to those that stuck with the honorifics, Minato-sama. Midori and Samson stood opposite to him. His wife was still asleep. The man smiles, watching as his followers looked up at him. I don't know how many times I have to say it. Minato speaks loudly, but with a gentle tune to his voice. I am no lord, nor am I your owner. He walks toward them, helping them up one by one. And I do not ask that you bend your will. I simply ask that you follow me, not serve me. The job of a leader is not to be served by those under him, but serve those that look up to him. My first students, myself, and my family are not rulers. Minato smiled as he helped an elderly woman up that the group's tailor. We are people just like you. Minato watches as the people stood up. Most weren't learning to use chakra. They simply started following them after one of their family decided to go with them. The sons of old men, the daughters of poor mothers. The old woman that Minato helped up was there because her granddaughter was saved by Midori. Two young men were learning to use the same power that saved their mother, and a man with a robot prosthesis was seeking purpose once more. They all stood together in the forest. It was a large camp in the middle of Sanus, nowhere near Vale City, but not too far from civilization. The morning sun hanged up in the skies with brilliant vibrate reds coating clouds. People all began their daily lives, some awaiting instruction from Minato himself. Midori was now a what Minato could consider a chunin, and so was Samson, with Danny getting close. However, with no one near where he'd consider a jonin, Minato resigned himself with assigning Midori and Samson their own student to teach. It was evident that if he was to make shinobi in this world a reality, and keep the practice in the right people, there was a need to expand. It wasn't viable in a modern city. It certainly wouldn't survive if people felt like they were a threat. Minato found that many whispers had been passed along his own people. Talks of building something new, a new home, and today he was going to plan for it. The people in this makeshift tribe had pledged themselves to him, whether he wanted that allegiance to servitude or not. They served him, and he would, in turn, serve them. The man with the robotic leg hobbled over to Minato. Sir, I wanted to speak with you in regarding my contacts in Mistral. All right? Minato acknowledged the man and smiled. So, what have they said? Mistral is looking to try and set about settling the twin islands to the south. These right here, my lord. Sir, the former huntsman pointed at the map, showing the two islands near the continent itself. Ah, Minato breathes as he looks at them. How big are they? My contact says they're both roughly 30,000 square miles. The southernmost island is steeped in thick forests, but it's quite cold there. The island off to its northwestern coast is mostly tempered as well, but I did a mission there once on a failed settlement. The former huntsman looked at his robotic leg. Minato frowns and placed his hand on the man's shoulder. Hephaestus, do not wallow in that sadness. We've taken our losses before. I know, sir. The former huntsman, Hephaestus, sighed. I just want a good place for us to settle. And I believe with younglings learning your ways, it'll go better than it did last time. Will the council even be willing to let outsiders settle there? Minato inquires as he crossed his arms. The man cackles. If they don't, what's the worst they'll do? You've been to Wine Path, sir. They can't even hold down a village right next door correctly. Their military power is on a decline. They stand again if they agree to sponsor us. The man then points at the map. Then there's also a menagerie. They're selling loads of land. Minato hummed. 
But isn't Menagerie mostly desert? That it is, but I'm sure given the time and effort we can from the nature around us to suit our needs. Hephaestos tells Minato, plus the White Fang need the money right now. So, we stand to gain some sort of political stance. Minato frowns a little as he asks, Do you think we'd have to worry about Faunus extremists despite our own population being mostly Faunus? Likely, the old former huntsman admitted. As much as I respect the Fong's leader, Gaira, for seeking peace. A lot of his lieutenants use that power to push an agenda, and most of the time the agenda is payback. This man, Gaira, would he be open to a sit-down with me? The shinobi leader asks. Gaira is a diplomat, of course, he'd be open to sit-downs. The old man answers. Very well then, Minato rolls the map back up before handing it to the old man. I want you to contact that friend of yours. If he can meet me in Vale City in a few weeks, I'll compose a letter detailing what I seek, what we need, and how we go about achieving our goals there as a unified force rather than some foreign company buying land. Ooh, careful sir, sounded like you've got some grievance with a certain dust company. Hephaestos laughs as he pats Minato's back. But to be fair, they're all a bunch of backstabbing yellow bellies. Minato sighs, I just find it better to have synergy rather than conflict. I agree. Both men turn to see Kushina holding Naruto in her arms. Look Narachan, two old men talking. The baby laughs as he points at them, gurgling as his mother bounces him around. Minato chuckled, walking over to her and giving her a quick kiss before he took Naruto into his arms. The woman stretches, yawning. Sorry for getting up late. Kushina apologized. What did I miss? Oh, nothing much. People trying to act like I'm sort of king again. Minato laughs. To be fair, Vale's last king has powers like your own, and that wasn't 80 years ago. We grew up on stories of the Valiant King. Hephaestos argues as he walks toward Minato, but certainly never did he produce such cute children. Ah, thanks. Kushina gushes as she looked at the old man. So, are we really planning a move that large? Yes, Minato tells her. We've been talking about doing this for a while now, so better now than never, correct? Kushina nods and looked at him. It is a little sad. I can't really forget about Kanoha, but I know that is just a fleeting dream now. We can only pray that our former home is safe. Minato replies while bouncing Naruto upon his arm. Besides, our little home is here. Indeed, it is she grabs both of their cheeks. With my two greatest joys in my life. Midori was walking with her students into the forest. She was the resident fire expert besides Kushina. Her students were training in that element. And just a half mile over would be Samson's training in the earth element. Like we practiced the other day. Midori instructs them, show me what you've learned. A girl walks up, much younger than her, about Danny's age. She claps her hands together, focusing for a moment before forming several hand seals. Katan, Anadoro. The girl yells as three little lamps of fire form behind her. They launch themselves at a target made of stone, bursting into flames with some explosive force behind them. She looked bashful. That was until Midori put her hand on the girl's shoulder. The young teacher smiled proudly, looking down at the younger girl. Very good, Rosalia. She turns to a teen, Iblis. Iblis formed the hand seals rapidly before forming eight lanterns behind him and launching them. They impact, obliterating the rock. The young fire wielder smirks, only to get a smack behind his head by Midori. The teen yelps a little bit, he looked up at Midori. Midori sighs, Iblis don't use your semblance to enhance your jutsu. It takes too much aura away from you. Use chakra only when it comes to this, and allow aura to be your defense. Yes ma'am, Iblis grumbled as he got behind Rosalia. Suddenly a large jet of water explodes from a tree. It impacts Midori who simply stood there and glared at the tree. Samson was standing on it, leaning back. Wow, holy crap, did you all see that surprise storm? He jests while he looked down at Midori. The girl yells at him, you're an ass. The Pine Martin Faunus jumps down from the tree. Sorry Midori, couldn't resist. All right, everyone take some time to practice your jutsu and hand seals. I don't want to see anyone slacking off tomorrow, Midori tells her students. The students bowed, running back toward the camp. She turns her gaze towards Samson, which turned into a glare. The teen rubbed the back of his head, but then smiled when he hands her a stack of letters. She looked confused until she noticed they were from Mistral. Your father sent you some of these, he told while smiling. I went into town while getting your scroll fixed, and apparently the same place as a post office. And they just handed you my letters? Midori eyed him suspiciously. Nope, Samson laughed. I transformed into you. Gosh, you're such an ass, Midori playfully complained. But if anything, you're my ass. Careful now, Samson flirted as he cupped her chin. That sounded almost like an I love you. Shut up and kiss me, you idiot. Midori pressed her lips against his. Both stayed lip-locked for a few moments, breaking off to get some air. They looked around before Midori grabs his hand to lead him deeper into the forest. The teachers needed their privacy. Ah, Mrs. Spindle, thank you for the lovely gift. Kushina thanks the old woman as she got Naruto's new onesie. It was orange in color with a red Uzumaki symbol on the back. Mrs. Spindle smiles, nodding her head as she watches the young men of the camp come back with some deer. It looked like she'd have some leather to work with. They were all in need future winter coats anyhow. Looks like the young men of this troop are bringing home the bacon. Mrs. Spindle joked as she looked at Kushina. Tell me, dear, how is your husband? We don't mean to stress him with our kneeling. He's fine. He was a leader back where we are from. 
I and he just believes that since this world welcomed us, we should give back as best we can. Kushina reaches into her pocket while holding Naruto. Here's some money for the onesie, by the way. Oh, come now, Mrs. Spindle, pushes the money away. My dear, you are taking me in and giving me purpose. That is all I want right now, purpose. Kushina smiled and took a seat next to Mrs. Spindle, getting ready to nurse Naruto. The rocking chair the woman had was a gift from Hephaestus. The man was a good crafter and seemed to have some contacts all over Remnant. Whatever information Minato needed, Hephaestus would usually get it within a few weeks. His crafting was coming in handy, also when it came to various other things. He made water purifiers from scrap metal and some electric dust. It was communal, but luckily, they also had a doctor in Mrs. Spindle as well. A retired surgeon from Vale. They look at the area before sighing, Mrs. Spindle spoke up. One day, this will just be a part of the infinite dream. Hmm. Kushina hummed. One day I'll be asleep, and I'll never have to wake up to these old bones. But, if I was to dream, I would love to dream of my life and relieve it. The hardships and all, but maybe find love. I never married sweetheart, Spindle tells Kushina, but it seems that I dedicated my life in pursuit of my dreams. I saved countless lives, and now, I warm countless lives. Spindle laughs as she looked at Kushina, and it's all funny how life works out, isn't it? A little, Kushina admitted. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Amen, Mrs. Spindle replied. The camp went about their business. In a few weeks' time, they'd be ready to move out. Hopefully, with Minato trying to find them somewhere to go. Somewhere permanently. The age of Shinobi and Remnant was slowly coming to a head. Naruto was walking for the first time, and months of delays finally came to an end. They had charred a ship and sailed the ocean blue. Kushino was holding Naruto's hands as he walked his first steps on the arid grasslands of Menagerie. The world seemed so much smaller than theirs, but it was just about the same size. Okasana hungry. Naruto mumbles his words, trying to form a sentence. She smiles, crouching down while reaching into her bag to get out some small crackers for him to eat. Watching as he stumbled on his own up a hill, silently celebrating her child's achievement in walking. The red-headed young mother looks down at the boy. Almost there Naruto, she encouraged her child. Oh, just a little bit further. She came up over a small hill, near a coastline. There she smiles, upon the shores of this small coast. Not far from the southern coast of Menagerie, lays the foundation of a new idea. Picking up her child as he ate his small crackers, putting him on her shoulders, her red tunic flutters in the wind, walking forwards on the carved-out road of solid earth from the usage of Dotan Jutsu. The small wall of stone that lined the village was still under construction. This closed-off community had little contact with the capital city of Menagerie. But there was an equal trade to this. The woodlands were cut and planted anew. The farms looked to have a bountiful crop in the works for the fall. It was the dream they had since coming to terms with what they were now to the world. Some people viewed them with fear. The unknown always scared the weak-minded and willed. Some saw her and Minato as divinity and the many within their own ranks saw them as a beacon of hope. The plague that infected people despite people having aura, could not infect those with their chakra awakened as well. It sent the body into overdrive, everyone with chakra activated was stronger and faster than most people. It wasn't extreme, but in a fight, every little boost helped. There were houses under construction, she could hear the moving of earth as two young men worked themselves ragged with using a doton jutsu to clean pathways for a small water system. Hephaestos was pretty much the architect behind their generators, and even designed the current one that ran off chakra instead of dust. There wasn't much electricity in this small village. Not that they lacked the power, they just haven't been able to set up everything. People looked on as she walked through, observing mother and child just being normal. Their house was built already. It was a modest two-story house near the coast. Coming to her door, she found that Midori was walking with her father, who had just moved to their small village with his son and his pregnant wife. The secret wasn't out exactly, but they were now on the map. Midori was dating Samson, they haven't talked seriously about getting married, but it has been thrown out a couple of times. Mrs. Spindle was still kicking, having her own little shop in the village's makeshift square. She saw that Minato had called a meeting, in their living room no less. He stood up while his people sat down, listening intently. Gyra Belladonna and the White Fang are personally financing this village. Minato tells them as he walked around the room. I've heard reports of bandit activity toward the northwestern wastes. Gyra is wanting to send out an entire platoon of his finest. The leader of the village looks at them. But I say we repay a debt. Sir, a man stood up. I can have my team ready in five hours. We are a balanced team, and my Jinin can make do with the experience. Minato smiles, then take the initiative, Ian. The red-eyed man nodded, bowing his head. Sir, Ian quickly left the room, excusing himself as he passed up Kushina. Midori was sitting on a couch by Samson. Minato resumes his plans for the village. Hephaestos listened intently. He had brought some designs with him that currently lay by the small closet door. Samson then spoke up. As much as bandits are a problem, I believe securing our home should take the forefront of our goals. But, the young man smiles. I know how you are Blondie Sensei. Which is why I will have my teams working around the clock to secure our village more. The same with me Sensei. Midori supported Samson. I know that we're a formidable force against anything that comes our way. But if we can prevent the death of even one of our own, we must focus on that. Minato nods as he listens to them. 
Then as with Ian, take the initiative. Samson and Midori got up, bowing to their sensei before walking out the door. The last ones there was Hephaestos, Sahaba, and Verselburn. Hephaestos was officially recognized with a moniker as the architect, and his designs were helping the village grow. The white-haired and light-eyed woman sitting on a chair was Sahaba. She was a young woman around their age. However, she was renowned as the soothsayer for a reason. She had lived in Menagerie all her life, and she essential when it came to be predicting how the weather would act up along the nearly uncharted southern coast. Sahaba had initially joined as an attaché from Gaira. She was a hawk faunus. Her trait was her keen eyes. The woman could see out to sea out within the southern mountains. Her abilities allowed her to set plans for any scouting operations, and she was in good standing among the people back in Kwakwana. Verselbrun Dawn was a nobleman that owed Minato his life. A couple of months ago, his caravan had gotten attacked by bandits, assassins, and he was facing down the blade of his would-be killer. Samson stepped in, killed the bandits, and slightly botched the rescue by using Jutsu openly. He was forced to bring Verselbrun here, but the nobleman took quickly to the excuse. Perhaps it was his silver tongue, or the way he acted, but Minato quickly struck a friendship with the man. The village truly now had all walks of life. Former vacuo thieves, poor Australians, broken Vale War veterans, and now an Atlasian noble. A melting pot, a culture united under one banner. The banner that Mrs. Spindle herself created at the village's conception. The banner flew over each house, representing unification, a swirl inside of a leaf. It looked no different to Minato's old headband he kept displayed in his room, reminding him of the life he accidentally left behind. However, a shade over three years in this new world made him adapt. His son's second birthday was coming up shortly, and Naruto was developing fast. There were talks about how the passing of leadership should work, and Minato admittedly thought about it in the sense of the world he was from. Those that show strength, those that show compassion, and those that honor. Separate, they were all great virtues to attest, but only the Hokage could have all three, and must uphold all three. Then again, this wasn't the Shinobi world. This is Remnant. There is a title in the works for his position, but until that day, he was content to be called just the leader. Verselburn looks at Minato. I called in a few favors in Atlas while I visited Kwakun. Oh. Minato looked at him as he took an open seat, watching his wife do the same. We are in need of cabling, so we can start getting houses to light up. The ship will be landing in Kwakana in five days, but you'll need to assign at least two teams to escort the shipment. Normally, I'd say give it to these genin, but I implore you friend that you give it to more experienced people. Verselburn tells Minato as he leaned back in his chair. Minato nodded in agreement. Of course, but we also got a shipment of building materials coming from Kwakana the same day as well. Bully. Verselburn happily gushed. We can just ship them here at the same time. Sahaba looks toward Kushina. A Mrs. Namakase. Sorry if we're taking any of your time from your husband. Our business is nearly concluded. No worries, Kushina replied with a smile. I know you all work too hard. Well, thank you for the pleasantry. Tell me though, how goes baby? Verselburn inquires as he looked at Kushina. Kushina looks at Minato and smiles. Which one? Minato's eyes widen. Your. M Kushina held up two fingers. Round two, mister. Minato smiles brightly getting up to sit by his wife, while more or less flopped down next to her. He took Naruto into his arms, smiling all the while. The baby gurgled out, there was some complaining as he reached back for his mother, but eventually settled with sitting with his father. In the center of the village, many simple wooden structures had been built. Some of them were starting to get reinforced by concrete and stone. The old saying goes, if you build it, then they will come. Well, they came, and came kept coming. Seven years later, the village was healthy. Walls around the outside were manned by several people at a time. Gates metal to the north, west, and east was the only true access, other than the ocean blue. Minato Namikaze was sitting in an office of sorts, wearing an orange robe with a village symbol on the back. Hephaestos was using a cane to walk, he looks at Minato with a nod as the man looked down at his oldest son, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. The child was energetic, in a lot of ways was his mother's child more so than his. Okay, so let's go over this again. Minato took a deep breath, you decided to create confetti paper bombs to scare new students? Naruto hummed as he looked at his dad. It was simple. No one ever looks up. Minato sighs. He was his mother's child, duly noted. To be Pharaoh Tosin, Minato turns to a redhead boy standing at the doorway. I kind of helped Nissen. Minato looked at his second child, smiling. Minma-chan. Otosin. Minma complains as he looks away, bashfully. Minma had the same round face as his older brother, born with three whiskers on his cheeks as well. The redhead's hair was flat instead of the spiky mess. His eyes, however, were green instead of the normal blue, and he inherited them from Kushina's mother. Oh, Minma, relax, Otosin is just teasing Databeo. Naruto, cheerfully points out. There is also one more thing he inherited from her. I don't need you to point that out, Nick and Datakeo. The redhead argued. Oh, Naruto and Minma glared at each other. Wanna go? Naruto-chan. Minato looked at his sons with a smile. Don't be too rough on your little brother. Minma quit picking fights with your Nikon. Yeah, Soto-sama. Both lowered their heads. 
Very good, but as for you both, you'll need to write an apology letter to each student. Starting today, go now, and you better be started before I get home. Minato chastised them. Naruto and Minma nod, running out of the office room. The man sighs, looking at Hephaestus. The older man chuckles, he was wearing a small ring on his finger. He had married Mrs. Spindle a couple of years ago. Neither one of them had been married throughout their life, but sadly, it was a short-lived peace. Mrs. Spindle had passed away the next year. Hephaestos wasn't looking too well himself either, but that was to be expected for his age. He sat in an office chair, looking at Minato. The older man looked at his designs still rolled up at the corner, future designs for the village once they could start growing. The grim population had a serious chunk taken out of its last year, thanks to Midori and Samson's efforts. Adaraishi grows every year, Minato tells Hephaestos. It's all thanks to you, my friend. Ah, you flatter an old man. Without Versalburn's connections in Atlas, or Sahaba's scouts, we'd never be able to get the resources to build my designs. My time is coming to an end, Minato Dano. The old man states as he looked toward his friend. Soon I'll join Lavender. The pyre will burn hot for you, old friend. Minato replies with a sad smile. How far along are you? Three months, the old man laments. I've called in one last favor. Hmm. Minato hums. An Atlasian engineer by the name of Yuki Shigemi. A young lad, he's a rising star looking to make a name. I had a sit down with him when I went to Atlas. He's very interested in coming to work for you. The title The Architect was created long before I was born and will remain long after I'm worm food. The old continues as he shakes slightly trying to stand up. But this village, Adaraishi, will remain. If you can manage, Minato sighed. You can bring him in as soon as possible. Hephaestos nods. Yes, sir. Oh, and Minato, thanks for all these years. No problem, my friend. Minato told the old man as he walked out of the office. Minato sat there, taking a deep breath. I never could make this happen without the people I met. Kushino was visiting Midori and Samson. She was walking with a small little girl. The little girl had blonde hair tied into pigtails. She wore an orange tunic that fluttered in the wind, much like her mother's. The daughter and mother walked by Samson and Midori. Midori was holding her bulging stomach. She was pregnant with her and Samson's first child. The two had been married for several years now. But with work finally slowing down, they could as well. The two came a long way from the hot-blooded and eager teens they were when they met Minato and Kushina. They walk into a small, recently built, diner of sorts. Adaraishi didn't really have huge fancy eateries. The village was small in comparison to the rest of the world cities, but being considered the second Kwakana of the world has its advantages. Namely, Kwakana shared a bit of a sibling love for its only other town, Gaira may not oversee the White Fang anymore, but they still upheld their obligations. They forward jobs to Adaraishi. They asked the village in the south to hunt down the tougher Grim. The most recent expansion of Kwakwana's waterway and waterworks was done by Hephaestos working with engineers there a year ago. The entire work was done by Dotan users, namely Yin's division of students. The job was twofold. It built relations, and it showed that Kwakwana's reliance on the outside world of Remnant was soon becoming a thing of the past. Farms were turning more crops. Cash crops grew better with the new waterways. It was a booming decade so far. The city of Kwakwana experienced probably the best economic growth of a city in decades, and itself was just about 20 years old. Adaraishi had grown in tandem, and now two sets of walls lined the village's outer limits. Giant Grim was a thing, and many of them lived out in the wastelands of Menagerie. If one was to come bumbling toward the village, the extra protection made it easier too for the village to protect itself. Midori and Samson played the major part of this defense. They were the first teachers of the newer generation coming into Adaraishi and being born within the village. Very few people whispered about huntsmen behind these walls. Instead, Shinobi was more used. Everyone wanted to be a Shinobi, or help them, because helping them made said people rich. Weapons were simpler. The need of guns was not big as with simple weapons. Swords, spears, tools of the trade, they were making a comeback. It was a simple life in the village. No extravagant structures, no malls or vehicles. The village itself was perfectly rustic. The best part was the food, and as Kushina sat down, she saw the cooks in the back of the diner getting ready. She had a history of eating a lot, so did her family, minus Minato. And Uzumaki needed the food, their chakra sources were massive, and that demanded a slight bit more sustenance to maintain. Midori looked at her sensei. So how is little Akahana? She's perfect as ever, isn't that right, Kei-chan? The mother coos her child. The toddler smiles. Okasan Abakin is big. Samson bursts into laughter with his wife. Wow, really, really? The girl sheepishly smiles, giving a toothy grin. I sorry, Dada saying. Kushina snorts in laughter. If she had red hair, she'd be a spitting image of me. For a one-year-old, she's definitely advanced. Midori observed as she looked at AK. You ever thought about enrolling her into the academy at five? I have, Kushina answered as she bounces the girl on her knee. But I'm content to let her be a child for a little bit longer than my sons. Oh, speaking of that, Naruto had to go see Minato-sensei. He decided to pull a prank, apparently. He was able to make a confetti paper bomb. Samson says as he chuckles. It was hilarious when I student thought someone actually planted a bomb. I swear that boy. Kushina pinched her nose as she sighed. I love him, but he sometimes takes things too far. 
We all got a laugh out of it, save for Ian, who had him report to Minato. Don't know what happened after that, but anyway, we got some news. Samson looked over at his wife. Midori smiles. I'm expecting twins. Oh wow, congratulations. No wonder you were bulging so early. Kushina gushed while looking at her former student. Girls, boys, we don't know, and we don't want to know. Midori admitted as she smiled sheepishly. We want it to be a surprise. Kushina almost felt like crying. I'm so happy for you. I know your dad would be. Yeah. Midori looked down at the ground. I can't believe. I'm no sweetheart. Kushina reached over and took her hand. Oh, buddy's probably looking down on you with the brightest smile. I know, Midori leans back. Is AK going to be your last child? Who knows? Kushina chuckled a little. I may want other kids in the future, but I'm content with having just three. Samson smiles. Well, I'm just happy to be a dad. Good, the red-headed matriarch of the village replied. You better treat them right, though. Because one day our kids may end up on the same team. True. The fox faunus looked at her husband. Ready to eat? Mom, I'm starving. Samson states as he saw a server come over toward them. Naruto was listening to a scroll playing music through headphones. Minma was doing some homework watching as another Naruto was reading off an actual scroll on the ground. The boys could read and write in kanji, and Naruto was currently reading off a scroll his father made. This is interesting, Naruto's clone says, apparently you make Earth Chakra by just increasing its density. You clump it together, Minma tells them as he looked up from his homework. Nikken, when are you going to tell Otosin about you learning the Kage Bunshin? Naruto pulled the headphones out of his ears. In a few weeks, Otosin will probably have me learn some more of our family jutsus. Minma nodded as he leaned back. Finally, I'm done, Dadakeo. The two boys looked at one another, both smiling. Nick and where is Okasan? Eating with Obeisin, Naruto tells him. Come on, let's go for a walk. But we're supposed to write the letters. Minma argued as he stared at his brother. Otosin will get mad at us. And I don't want to clean the bathrooms at the school. Naruto rolls his eyes. All right, fine. The only person that made it a big deal was Ian sensei anyway. Still, his red-headed little brother argues. We owe people an apology. Naruto grabs a stack of paper. Okay, Minma, let's get started. Nick and Minma looked at his older brother. Yeah, Naruto asks as he starts getting ready to write. What is it? Can you teach me the Kage Bunshin no Jutsu? Minma requests as didn't face up from the paper. The firstborn son of Namikaze looked at his little brother. Sure, I'll start teaching you next week. Yes. Minma celebrates as he pumps his fist. Naruto snaps his fingers. Now come on, let's back to this. A large flying grim dove down at a group of white fang soldiers. Its screech drowned out the area as it dives at the people below. Except, just about the time it was to crash into the people, a figure in a cloak jumped up. Several clouds of smoke suddenly burst around the group, revealing it to be a trap. The wagon they were escorting was fake, bursting into smoke as the cloaked figure tackled the wings of the massive Grim. Several chains emerge out of the cloaked people's hands, grabbing the giant Grim and holding it down. Its roar sounded, making many a small animal run for cover. The cloaked figure's hood flew off from the wind of the massive beast's roar. Blonde spiky hair, energetic blue eyes, and three whiskers just above a lip with a fox-like smile on it. The owner of this fox-like smile was Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. His adamantine chains held a massive beast down as his younger brother Minma jumped from a nearby tree to get above it. The younger son of the Namikaze family quickly ran through hand seals. Katan, Kitsunabi. Minma roars out as several balls of fire launch from in front of him. The flaming balls impacted the massive Grim, igniting its wings as it thrashes about. Naruto finished forming hand seals of his as he let his clones take over holding the beast down. He rears back, gathering chakra into his throat. The blonde roars out, Futon, Kuden. The massive ball of air that launches from his mouth causes the flames to rise, growing hotter and hotter. Minma lands by his brother, forming clones of his own as he stands back to back with his brother. The massive Grim finally dies, exploding into black dust as several Beowulfs ran from out of the woods nearby. The clones all engage them, using special three-pronged kanai to slash and counter the beasts. Naruto and Minma nod at each other before sprinting toward a rather large Beowulf. Naruto uses his adamantine chains to wrap it up as Minma formed a sphere of energy in his hands. The red sphere crackles with power as slammed the attack into the large Beowulf, Rasengan. Naruto's eyes widened as he noticed a Beowulf blow past their clones and heading straight for his little brother. The blonde smirked as he disappeared in an orange flash. His orange cloak fluttered in the wind as he appeared behind Minma. A blue sphere formed in his hand before he smashes it into the Beowulf, Rasengan. Damn, there's a lot here. Minma laughed as he saw his clones kill his share. Naruto's clones had dispersed when he used a jutsu to teleport to Minma's side. The two brothers stand together, with their eyes seeing the incoming of more. Adaraishi's finest sons each took a step forward at the same time before becoming blurs as they ran toward the danger. The two brothers uppercut a large Beowulf together, before Minma springboards off Naruto's back and cuts through the demonic wolf with a sword. His older brother throws a kick backward and kicks in a Beowulf's face. Suddenly the crash of a large club sends the ground quaking upwards at them. Naruto flips backward, gaining air in order to grab Minma's hand and throw him into a creep. The creep screeches in pain as Minma cuts it apart, 
while Naruto looks at a giant cyclops leading a pack. The blonde smirks, come get some data Bayo. The beast roars out, using the club in its hands to smash Naruto as he launched a kanai at it. The blonde was smashed into the ground. But when it pulls its club up, there was no bloody smear. There was just a smashed up log. The blonde suddenly emerges from a flash as the kunai flies behind the giant Grimm's head. Heads up, dumbass. Naruto screams as he launches chains from his body. The chains wrap around the creature, sinking into the ground to hold it down. The creature thrashes about as it falls, roaring for another Grimm to come and help it. Naruto's response to such a thing was to create a very large Rasengan in his right hand. He holds it above his head, it grows and grows until it was about 10 feet wide all around. He jumps up before smashing the giant ball of energy into the creature. A massive boom resounds across the forest as the creature is killed. Naruto stands in the black dust with a smile on his face, his eyes shining in the darkness before he disappears in a blur of speed. Minma dodged slashes from several Beowulfs, and when one launched itself at him, he cut it down the middle with his sword. Naruto flashed next to his brother, spinning on his heel after forming a one-handed seals rapidly. Futon Ripusho, Naruto yells as he blasts the Beowulfs away, with a blast of wind from his hands. The blonde looked at Minma who nodded, both got back to standing against each other. Back to back, Naruto and Minma noted that their other teammate was probably getting the White Fang soldiers to safety while they took care of things. They had been assigned a mission to take out a rather large horde of Grimm, and the Great Waste was heading toward Kwakana, and Gaira feared that Sienna's aggression would cost the life of the White Fang members she sent there. Minato assigned his sons to the mission as more of a courtesy. He planned on giving his son the seat someday. What better way for him to learn that in the field? Naruto's orange cloak fluttered in the wind as he and Minma faced down another wave of Grimm. The plan was that they'd hold them off until Shijara could get the White Fang members to safety, so they didn't get caught in a crossfire. Shijara. Minma yells out as he tosses a kunai up, signaling that they were ready for the final phase. The teens were then joined by a white-haired girl with metal claws wrapped around her hands. Ra. She roars as she tears through the beats with her chakra-enhanced attacks, jumping back and kicking the head of a Beowulf clean off. The trio stood back to back as they started forming hand seals. The girl finishes hers first, looking at Minma with a smile. Her green tunic whipped in the winds as Naruto finished his own hand seals. Her green eyes lit up as she saw Minma readying his. Minma Kun, on your go! She yells as saw the Grim coming. Minma slammed his hands into the sand. Right, Shigurucha, Dotan, Doryua. Minma yells as stones began to rise and flow through and around the Grim. The white-haired girl smirks as she unleashed her own jutsu. Karyu Inden. She jumps up as flames pour from her mouth, igniting the nearby trapped Grim. The beasts roar out as they thrashed into their stone traps. Naruto smirked as his adamant and chains circled his team. He finished gathering Churka before slowly the desert began to churn around him. Then suddenly a blur of sand began to spin, faster and faster until a vortex formed. Futon, Tatsumaki, no jutsu. Shijara smirks as she and Minma formed hand seals. Do it Naruto-san, right? Naruto yells out as he increased the vortex's power. The beasts inside began to be ripped apart as the flames of fire chakra began to join the winds of wind chakra. Slowly, but surely, the dusty tornado began to ignite. Naruto's chakra barrier stemming from his adamant and chains allowed them protection as the flames roared. The flaming world calms to a stop, the dust dispersing, revealing glass across the desert ground where Naruto and company were standing. The group looked around, noticing no more Grimm were in the area. Naruto looks at his brother, smiling. The two shared a fist bump with Shijara. Naruto stares at the great waste of Menagerie's desert, his cloak fluttered in the winds as he could have sworn someone was watching them. However, he sighed and then watched as Minma and Shijara started walking back without him. Grim attacks were common, but something did feel off about this one. Naruto stayed staring into the waste, expecting a giant pair of eyes to open back at him. When nothing happened, he slowly began to walk back. Back to Kwakana, so they could get back to Adaraishi. Adaraishi bristled with life as a new day dawned upon the city. Naruto was walking along the dirt roads, he was finishing up a mission. The teenager felt the wind blow past him, he smiles as he looked out toward the open sea. He saw the waters churn, the waves crashing against the shoreline. The teen watches as a pregnant woman, helped by her husband out of the house. There was a cool breeze in the wind today, today was October 10th, his birthday. He didn't expect anything, his father was always busy, and his mom had a new one-year-old to take care of. His newest little sister, Azwaka, was being a brat compared to what they were. The 16-year-old watches as a blacksmith forged some weapons for the local shinobi forces. The concept of shinobi was an easy concept to grasp, it would seem, 16 years ago Naruto's parents started this. Would have been just 5 people, blew up to 30, then to hundreds. Many didn't use chakra for combat, or the skills they learned to fight, instead, they applied it to daily life. The blacksmith, for example, used fire release to amplify his flames, making his steel stronger. Earth users would quickly build waterways, now began building houses on the outskirts, and helped pave the land for farming. It took a long time, but Adaraishi was self-sustaining. Walking down the road as a group people approached him, and they held a gift toward Naruto. Happy birthday, Naruto-sama. He smiles, taking the gift into his hands. Thank you. 
No problem, open it up. The leader of the group, a woman, cheered. Naruto opens it up, revealing a light blue hakama and an orange Hayori with a village symbol on the back. It was made from silk and cotton from what Naruto could feel. This was obviously a gift meant to show off whenever he got the chance, placed the items back into the box and smiled. He bowed to them, thank you, it is a lovely gift. I hope it didn't affect your houses, you all tend to the village way too hard down a bail. For the child of Minato Namikaze, the woman spoke with a bright smile. No gift is too big. Naruto rubbed the back of his head held the box with his right hand. Well, that's not true. The greatest gift I can get is from the people I protect. You're my brothers and sisters, my comrades. If you don't think a gift is too big, Naruto rubbed his chin with his free hand. Then help me build Adaraishi, even more when the time comes. Yes, sir. The group shouted in unison, calling the troops to battle. Naruto's eyes widened. Otosin, Minato pats his son's shoulder as he walked to stand beside him. The duo looked so like each other minus the whiskers and round face on Naruto. The blondes shared a smile as someone got a camera out, chuckling once they ran back into the crowd. Otosin, Naruto looked at his father. How is Okasan and does Wakachan? They're both doing fine. Minato chuckled as he pulled Naruto to follow him as he began to walk. Naruto, I know I've been busy lately, and you've been doing a lot of missions. I know. Naruto smiled with a small laugh. So, what's up Otosin? I want you to just help Okasan around the house. Minato patted his son's back. Let me run the day-to-day -day affairs for once, eh? Naruto nods as he looked at his father. Minma come back from his mission yet? Not yet. Minato lamented as he sighed. You know your younger brother wouldn't miss your brother for the world. True. Naruto replied as they walked around the corner of a shop and onto another street. I just wish that we could do more for our village. We do enough. Minato chortled as he draped his arm around Naruto. The sun rises on us, and we live. How many shinobi are there now? Naruto wondered as he looked at ocean waves. Dozens. We have 200. The older blonde laughed. The sea grows ever more. Naruto smiles as he looked as several children ran by him. Yeah, it does. The pair make it to their house. It was three stories now, with probably the best looking decor around. Naruto got ahead of his father and unlocked the door, allowing Minato to walk in first. But as he walks in, he has a piece of cake smashed into his face. Surprise. His whole family shouts, including Midori and Samson. Gah. Naruto nearly breathed in the cake up his nose after it got smashed into him by Akahana. The teen watches as blue and orange frosting falls from his face. Minmo was standing there with Shijara. Akahana runs around toward her mother, sticking her tongue out, playfully teasing her older brother. Samson watches as Midori nursed their child, and Kushina was smiling warmly at Naruto. Minmo walks up to Naruto, flicking him the head, eliciting a yelp from his older brother. The blonde rubbed the sore spot, grumbling as Minma then brought his arms around Naruto. Happy birthday, Nikin, Minma said with a smile. The flick was doubting I'd be back in time, dummy. You knew. Naruto yells as he blushed a little bit. Minma laughs as he rubbed his long red hair. I followed you around a village. It wasn't super hard. Pinching his nose, Naruto just chortles. So, how was your mission, brother? It was good, but come on, let's celebrate. Minma led Naruto toward the table, to the greatest Nikon and future leader of Adaraishi. Happy birthday, Naruto Taishu, Shijara said with a smile and greeted him with a handshake. Naruto giggled and sat down, thanks Shijara-san. Okasan, Obeisan, sit down, you've got babies. Midori laughed and Kushina just sighed, just because we got little ones doesn't make us helpless. I know Okasan, but you and Obeisan need to relax. After all, I know Tosin isn't getting up at night to change diapers. Minato shot a playful glare at his son for the comment. After all, you both work too hard. Speaking of working too hard, Minma rubbed Naruto's shoulders. You're very tense, brother. How many scouting missions did Sahabasan send you on? Too many. Naruto leans back before flicking his brother's head. And that was for earlier. Why you? Minma and Naruto got ready to leap at each other. Kushina uses her chains from her back to hold both down. All right, you two, later. Naruto, what would you like to do today, since it is your birthday? I was thinking we can go to ramen bar. Naruto answered as he pecked a piece of cake of his face. I'll pay, after all I've been saving up. Speaking of that, Minato chuckled as he looked at Shijara and Minma. I got some good news. I think I should tell him Otosin. Minma interjected as he looked at his brother. You know me and Shijara have been good friends since grade school. Yeah. Naruto questioned and then noticed that she was holding his hand. Minma giggled as he rubbed the back of his head. She's my girlfriend. Naruto looked at her. About time honestly, what are you waiting for a proposal? Shijara gave a boisterous laugh as she slapped his shoulder. Careful now, or I'll end up just more than his girlfriend one day. You are both 14, sheesh. It's a little young to be thinking about that. You know, Naruto took another piece of the smashed cake into his mouth. We have a meeting regarding Veil tomorrow. I know, and you'll be attending. Are you volunteering? Minato questioned Naruto. His oldest son nodded as he looked at his father. Yeah, it was my plan to go into Veil as a representative of Adaraishi. You know, Blake Belladonna ran away, right? Minato asked as he looked at Naruto. Naruto nods as he sighs. And I know why she sent me a text message stating that Adam has gone bunkers with power. Of course, Kushina rolls her eyes. 
I never liked that boy. If I run into her there, I'll make sure to inform Gaira and Kali, Naruto said to his parents before getting up. I'm gonna go wash up, and we'll head out, alright? Sure son, Minato pats Naruto's shoulder. We'll be down here. Minma was watching as his older brother and mother danced. It was a simple dance where two people waltz around with the back of their hands together. After a few rotations, they would spin opposite before waltzing the opposite direction. Naruto and Kushina put a little flair into their dance by clapping their hands when they spun around. Minato was sitting with his youngest daughter watches his son and wife dance. He laughed when Naruto almost stepped on Kushina's toes. Careful there, Minato laughed as he watches Naruto spin in unison Kushina. You almost broke your Okasan's foot. Naruto stuck his tongue at his father. I like to see you try to do better old man. Minato handed his youngest daughter to Midori, who gladly took her. I gotta go school my son a little bit. I know. Midori giggled as she bounced her son in her lap with the girl. Hey there is Waka. The baby gives a smile, happily babbling as she looked at her fellow infant. Samson laughed with Midori as the two began to vie for her affection. She turns around, watching as Minato pushes Naruto with his hip out of the way, sticking his own tongue out at his son before speeding up the dance with his wife. Pouting a little bit, Naruto still had a smile on his lips. Walking over toward their table, the blonde took a seat by Midori, looking at his baby sister. Midori nods at him, and he simply plucked the little girl up from her lap. The girl giggles and began to rest herself against her older brother. Azwaka was the first and only Namikaze born without whisker marks. Instead, she had more pointed fangs that grew in early first, so she couldn't really be breastfed. Naruto reached over for her bottle, laughing when she babbles and pointing at it. His Hayori had some milk drop on it when it fell out of his little sister's mouth, but he didn't pay any heed to it. Instead, he just snuggled up to her, smiling. So, this is an Adaraishi party, a man commented as he took a seat at their table. Quite frankly, I am a little bit impressed at the rustic nature of it. Naruto took a glance at the man, he had silver hair and hazel eyes. The man also had a mug in his hand, from what Naruto could smell, it was cocoa, something rather enjoyed. The two met eyes as Naruto looked toward him, he then hands Midori his little sister back. Ashpin san Naruto greeted as he stood up. You are early. I'm merely lucky enough to arrive in Kwakana early. Ashpin watched as the village leader and wife danced. You must be his son. What is your name? Naruto Namikaze. Naruto answered as he extended his hand out. It's a pleasure to meet you. I was going to be at the meeting tomorrow. Oh well, as you may know, the Vale government have taken interest in Adaraishi. We're looking for someone willing to represent this village, and how they use magic to bend the elements. Ashpin states as he looked at Naruto, and seeing as you have an eye for adventure, Minato stops dancing with his wife and walks over interjects. Ashpin, didn't expect you here so soon. Forgive the intrusion. Ashpin apologized as he rubbed the back of his head. I was merely having a conversation with a future Adaraishi chief. As I can see, Minato looked at Midori. Midori-chan, you and Samson Kuen please escort children elsewhere. Yes sir, Midori picks up her son and Azwaka. Samson, can you get Azwaka? Sure dear, Samson took Minato's youngest daughter into his arms. Shall we inform Kushina-sensei? Yes, Minato told him as he motions for them to leave, and he watches as his oldest son gets up. Minato took a deep breath. No, no, you stay. Naruto stopped, plopping back down into his seat. Yes, Otosin. Normally it is custom for party to bring refreshments, especially if it is the receiving party. However, Ashpin smiled as he leaned back in the chair he occupied. Me dropping unannounced is a bit uncouth and for that, I apologize. Don't make a big deal of it. Minato waved it off as he watches the partygoers slowly leave the room. Though your timing could have been a little bit better, my son was having a good time on his 16th. Ah uh, yes, I do apologize for that as well, Naruto. Um, San? Ashpin asked for confirmation. Naruto nods. Yes, we're on friendly terms, so San is the corrected Ashpin San. Truly a culture based on respect, Ashpin praised as he yawns. I'll be frank, many of my fellow council members do not like the idea of this so-called magic being taught publicly. Minato shook his head. It's not magic, it's merely manipulation of the elements through the combination of physical and spiritual energy. Aura. Ashpin hummed his question. Minato gave small chortle. Close, it is called chakra. Chakra and aura are basically in principle the same thing. The only difference is that aura has more of the physical energy aspect than spiritual. Two sides to the same coin, Ashpin realized with a laugh. My people fear many things, yet yours do not fear many. We've no reason, the Namikaze had stated. The only thing we must fear, as with all intelligent life here, is the fear of fear itself. Mm, the headmaster of Beacon Academy pursed his lips. Do you know that you are a bit of celebrity in the main contents? I don't care, Minato acknowledged with a frown. People will tell stories without seeing the being they tell about. Just like those people will tell of me, but never know me. Ashpin nods, a brutal cycle, myth and reality. I think that cooperation will be good for both of us. Naruto chimed in as he folded his arms. I may be young, but it'll fall to my shoulders to make Adaraishi survive. Otosan and Okasan built this dream, and I want it to live. A proud smile came to the father's face as he placed his hand on his son's shoulder. Naruto looked at him. Minato gave him a nod of approval. 
Ashbin smiled at this and looking about the area. There were lanterns and banners with a village's symbol on it. A fighting force of highly skilled warriors to boot. This place was a fortress none dared try to conquer. You have high expectations for yourself? Ashbin praised Naruto as he several figures run on top of buildings. I have no doubt you're powerful enough to defend your people as well. I am. Naruto agreed as he took a sip of his drink that he left at the table from earlier. However, I don't go around announcing to the world when I got up my sleeve. Fair enough, it is always good to keep at least two aces under your glove. Ashbin said before yawning, but since we're here now, I think it could wait until the morning. Minato tried to parlay the meeting only for Naruto to shake his head. Naruto, Otosin, Naruto smiled as he looked at Ashbin. The needs of the village outweigh my need for a peaceful birthday. I know, Minato rolled his eyes. I taught well enough, I suppose. Naruto took a deep breath. So, Ashbin san, what is that you wanted? Security mostly. Ashbin replied before taking a sip of his cocoa. Security. Naruto hummed as he thought about it. The vital tournament is in nearly a year's time, correct? Ashbin smiles. You keep yourself well informed, it is. You're worried that someone may make a move. Honestly, I may not be super book smart. However, I know well enough that your weakest point is always at your strongest. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Naruto kept his decorum as he became blunt. You think that someone, say an enemy of all four kingdoms, would make their move? Ashbin inquired. Naruto grumbles a little. Five kingdoms. Menagerie is a kingdom. Her citizens, be they faunus or human, are brother and sister under shared banners. You are aware that the White Fang have suspected in multiple robberies in Vale, correct? Ashbin questioned Naruto. I am. Naruto concurred as he leans back in his chair. However, I will not sit here and say that I'm surprised. Naruto looks at his father. Otosin, you were around the coronation of Sienna Khan as the high leader of the White Fang. Huh? Minato grumbled a little bit. My how the shoe fits well on you. But anyway, Minato then looked at Ashbin. Sienna Khan's power grab left a big vacuum. The vacuum has driven the other sectors of the Fong, the Vale and Vacuo sectors especially, into a bit of power grab. The leader of Adaraishi then spoke, shady alliances, clandestine operations, betrayal, and subterfuge. These things hurt the good people within the group, while extremist makes life tough for both parties. I'm assuming you have inside people. Ashbin assumed as he looked at both. I would hope that you aren't one of the fringe elements. We're not. Naruto spoke with a soft voice. We're merely caught in a very interesting middle. That you are. Ashbin looked toward Minato. Minato-san, can I add the sand with you? You may. Minato crossed his arms. However, don't be afraid to add something to the end of someone's name. Just don't refer to me as Chan. Ah, because that's mostly used for girls, I assume. Ashbin teases a little bit. It is. Minato leaned forward. Now get to the point. Ashbin looks at Naruto. I think your son would be the perfect representative. I can do more than just that. Naruto offered up as he gave Ashbin a smile. I just need a few days to prepare, and I'll ship out. Very well. Well, these were eventful talks. Ashbin got up and offered his hand. Minato and Naruto smiled. They took it and shook the man's hand. They all parted with a bow, with the father and son walking back toward their house. Ashbin, on the other hand, saw two people drop down in front of him. He saw that they were wearing masks in the likeness of animals. Ashbin san, one of them said, Forgive us, but you must not freely walk around Adaraishi without authorization. The headmaster nods. Very well. May I please be escorted to my dwellings for the next few days? Yes, sir. The one with tiger mask answered. Please, just follow us. I meant to ask, do you have a CCT tower? Asked the person in the tiger mask. I have to make call. We don't. The other one in a swallow mask answered. Kwakana has a CCT tower. Perhaps you and Naruto-sama can head there tomorrow. You seem to respect the son of your leader heavily. Ashbin smiles as he looked at them. How well do you trust him? Naruto-sama saved my daughter's life, and his son's on a mission gone wrong against the Grim. Without him, I'd rather not get into it. The mask wearer, a woman, praised. It's not all for show. Ashbin looked over his shoulder to see Naruto and Minato looking at him after they had stopped walking. He is legitimately considered a hero like his father. Gaira Ajizen, Kalio Basin. Naruto called out as he packed his backpack into a large estate. Gaira, a very muscular faunus man, with black hair and hazel eyes, smiled. He looked at the blonde with mirth in his eyes, quickly walking down to meet the teen. Callie was flanked by a couple of servants on her way down the steps to meet the blonde. Naruto, Gaira ruffled the boy's hair. Welcome to your home away from home. Naruto rolls his eyes while giggling a little. Hey, Kalio Basin. Hello, young man. My, you get more handsome every time you visit. Callie complimented the teen. So, what brings you here? I'm just stopping by to tell you guys bye. Naruto rubbed the back of his head. I'm going to veil as a representative for Adaraishi. You know, all that political bull. Naruto noted Gaira's glare. Crap. The man smiles. Good, and oh my, you brought a very distinguished guest with you already. Ashbin nods when is acknowledged by Gaira. You must be the great Gaira Belladonna. I don't know if that title means much these days. Gaira admitted with a small smile. However, I must ask why you are here. I came personally to talk to Minato Namikaze. Instead, I was used as a test for his son's future chances at leading the village. Shrewd, but well played. I also would like to talk to you both privately with Naruto. 
Gyra and Callie look at each other. They lead them both toward the private study, Callie motioning for their guards to leave, closing the doors and locking them. Naruto took a seat at one of the big comfy leather chairs Callie loved. Ashpin did the same, not hiding a moan that escaped his lips as he felt the soft fabric on his back. Ashpin watched as they took their seats. Okay, this information is regarding your daughter. Gyra and Callie look at each other. Callie then asks Ashpin, What do you know? She is alive, she is healthy, and very talented youth. She came to Beacon at first. I thought she was making a play for the White Fang in the region, but she told me everything. Adam Taurus, the leader of Vale's sect, has become corrupt. Ashpin reveals to them, making Callie frown. She sighs. I wish she'd listened to me about him. Callie, Gyra comforted his wife. We all make dumb mistakes in our youth, but Adam will take her leaving personally. Hold on, Naruto growled as he looked at them. Are you saying Adam may try to hurt Blake Nikon? Gyra nods as he looked at Naruto. We're in no position to try and protect her. Don't worry. Naruto stood up as he looked at them. I'll do it. I'm going there anyway. Callie smiles and reached over taking Naruto's hand. Thank you, you were always like a little brother to our daughter. You are family. Naruto tells her as he rubbed the back of his head. When Gyra Ajizen allowed Otosin to settle here, my father's village thrived. Thusly, we do what we can for each other. The former high leader of the White Fan nods. Still, Naruto, it's more than we could ask of you. No, Naruto disagreed. It's not enough. When does your ship leave? Gaira inquired as he looked at the youth in the eyes. Naruto frowned a little. It leaves out in a few hours. How unfortunate we wish you could stay for tea and such. However, you have a job to do. Naruto, Callie looked at her adoptive nephew. Please give this to Blake. Callie takes a necklace off her neck. That way she'll know that we know she's safe. It would be an honor. Naruto accepted with a smile. Go on now, Git. Gaira walks over toward his study's door. You got a boat to catch. Naruto and Ashbin walk out of the study and quickly out of the estate. There, they saw the bright fall sun of mid-October. The two look at one another, with Naruto feeling some trepidation in taking this journey. No team to back him up. Naruto-san, Ashbin motioned for him to go. We must quickly catch the boat. I understand. Naruto took a deep breath. I've never been so far from home before. The world is now yours. Ashbin laughed as he and Naruto walked. What will you do? I wonder so much if life threw you a curveball. Don't know. Naruto chuckled in response. Guess swing for the fences. Ashbin couldn't help but pat the boy's shoulder. I think you'll do just fine. So, Naruto looked at a cloud. What will I be doing there? You will basically talk to the council, provide minor security for Beacon during Vital in August of next year. Hopefully, just maybe we can hash out a deal that allows my country to work with your people. Ashbin offers up as he and Naruto rounded a corner. Naruto smiled. I like that. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content. Click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.